afternoon uh, with uh, with Tony Blank from Context.io. So uh, I met uh, Tony and API is uh, San Francisco in a hackathon, API Hack Day. So he had he was kind of skinhead, just 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 a little small hair, and this guy has always a different hair. So uh, this is a wig, by the way. <laughs> so so yeah, and he will he, um, he will make a. Uh, a really good talk about uh, uh, mail as data source for applications. Yeah, APIs enables new data to uh, uh, to be to be used for uh, making uh, useful application and valuable ones. So he will he will um, tell you exactly how how we do it. And uh, and yes, yeah, so Tony, I'm really glad to have you there. Context.io, I think made a great service, and let's rock with it. Thank you. Please some applause. All right, thank you, Betty. So uh, my name is Tony Blank, and uh, I'm a developer evangelist for Context.io. And today I'm gonna to be talking about how you can use email as a data source for your applications. So I'm gonna uh, first start off by talking about uh, an overview of the technologies that uh, make up email, uh, how your apps could leverage email data, then I'm gonna talk about the IMAP protocol and uh, just a very kind of high level overview of kind of the, the troubles and pitfalls and caveats that you'll have to uh, deal with if you wanna work with email servers to pull all that data off of them. Then I'm gonna talk very briefly about what uh, my API does. So uh, it's very good to be here. Uh, this is my first time in Paris. It's a beautiful city. I've, uh, I bought a bunch of Metro cards uh, and I haven't used them. I just walked around everywhere. It's, it's great. Um, but anyway, uh, email's been called dead uh, lots of times by a lot of people. There's been a lot of attempts uh, to uh, replace email. Uh, you know, like there's projects like Google Wave that uh, didn't quite take off, wasn't able to do it. Uh, let me start off by asking you all a question. Uh, by a show of hands, how many people have checked email at least one time today? Yeah, it's pretty much everybody. Uh, how about within an hour of waking up? Like first thing in the morning, yeah. Okay, uh, who's who's checking it right now while I'm talking? <laughs> yeah, I mean me too, because my phone's gonna vibrate if I get something, and I'm gonna just excuse me, guys. I gotta gotta get this. Uh, yeah, so uh, there's 3.9 billion email accounts in uh, 2013. 25 percent of those are corporate accounts, so uh, email is certainly big in business and enterprise. Uh, by 2017, it's gonna be uh, 4.9 billion email accounts, so it's continuing to grow. This technology that has been called you know, dead or waning uh, is really uh, not, it's still very much alive. Uh, every single day over 180 billion email messages are sent. Uh, and I, I do have the uh, stat on how many tweets per day. I, I don't want to uh, diminish social media's impact. I mean, certainly uh, social media, Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn have been uh, changing the way that we communicate. But if you look at the volume of, of messages sent, uh, email is certainly the, the predominant way that, that people communicate with each other. So not only does email have a massive user base, but the breadth of what people do with it is pretty impressive. So I mean, these are the things that, that people use email for. Uh, email is not a great method of handling all of these different things. Uh, it's a great transport mechanism for sending information, but it's, it, the email client is not the best way to actually manage all these things. So as an app developer, you're trying to solve your user's uh, pain points, right? So if you want to solve any one of these problems, you have two options. You can either start from scratch and build an application that ignores email, and that's gonna be a very clean solution. I mean, as, as an engineer, that really appeals to me to start from scratch, no legacy, no, nothing, and, and I can design the perfect uh, solution for my users. But the problem is email's very sticky. People spend hours a day inside their inboxes. So what I would argue is the thing that you would want to do is to integrate email data into these applications. Take the method that people are uh, already using to, to do all these activities and build things on, on top of email. But to do that, you're gonna have to get your hands dirty. So let's, uh, let's take a look uh, at some, uh, just a brief overview of uh, the different kind of email protocols. Anybody know what SMTP stands for? Yeah, yeah. do you know what it is? Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, so it stands for uh, the Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, and, uh, and it's basically just that guy right there. Um, it's just the transport. It has nothing to do with the actual body or the headers. Uh, it's basically just the envelope. It gets the email message from point A to point B. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with, with how it's stored. It's simply moving it across the network. Okay, uh, DKIM and SPF, anybody have any idea what, what those are? So uh, they are uh, standards for preventing uh, spoofing and, and that kind of thing. Uh, DKIM stands for Domain Keys Identified Mail, and SPF is the sender policy framework. Uh, basically, it's the door guy. Uh, they complement spam filters. It's a different way that, as a recipient, you can, you can block unwanted messages. Uh, email deliverability is a, a very big industry, uh, and, and, and so there's a, a lot of stuff about that. That's kind of tangential to this talk, but I uh, just wanted to point that out. Okay, IMAP. Anybody know what IMAP stands for, what the acronym stands for? Nobody? Cool, it's the uh, Internet Message Access Protocol. Uh, so once the, the email message is inside of the user's uh, inbox, or I'm sorry, inside of the email server uh, via SMTP, uh, the user has to have some way to actually retrieve the message. So IMAP is basically just a, a filing cabinet. Uh, all the messages are stored on the server. Uh, any email client pulls that server and gets information off of the server. So on point number two there, uh, that means that any changes that are made in one client uh, are reflected in all clients because they're actually changing the state of a message on the server. Uh, and, and so I also wanted just to point out that while uh, clients don't really send messages, email clients do a lot of caching. So that there is a lot of stuff that's stored there. Um, okay, POP. Anybody know what POP stands for? That's it, yeah, post office protocol. I wish I had a t-shirt to throw you. I'm sorry about that. Uh, it's basically just, just a, a mailbox. The one difference is that with POP, uh, the server is just a buffer. It just temporarily stores messages and then the client pulls things off. So in, 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 uh, in the POP world, uh, everything is, is client side. So it's not really useful to build apps on top of POP servers because if your application is manipulating emails and downloading new emails and stuff, then the user's not gonna see it in their email client. So it's, it's very hard to, to, to build an app on top of that. And I also just wanted to point out uh, RFC 822 is the uh, standard that defines what the email message body is. Uh, it was written in 1982, so it's still old, but it's, it's still used I mean, every, every day today. Um, the, there is a modern spec, it's RFC 5322 that was written in 2008, but that's not really used too much. So uh, I just wanted to point out that it's, it's a, um, there's been a, uh, th there hasn't been a lot of innovation in, in the email space, but it, it doesn't matter because it, it works uh, for what we try to do. So what kinds of things do you want your app to do uh, is, is the next thing. Uh, you might want your app to send uh, email to users. So if, if you want to do this yourself, you can set up an SMTP server, use uh, some software like Sendmail, uh, or there's great APIs like SendGrid or uh, Mailgun that, that can do that kind of stuff as well if you don't want to deal with it uh, yourself with your own servers. You might want to uh, have your app receive emails. So you could set up a postfix server, you could pipe the emails that come into a script and, and your app can handle them however you want. Uh, again, there's, there's great APIs that can, that can do, do this for you, uh, like, like SendGrid as well. Uh, you might want your app uh, to just access the user's emails and do something cool with them. So you're not sending and receiving, but you want to see what emails your users are sending and receiving. So you know, why would you want to look at that data? Well, it's because you know, you're trying to solve any one of these, these pain points. You have to get access to that email to, to, uh, to, to solve those problems. So uh, let's take a look at a couple of applications that are built on top of email data to kind of illustrate what, what you can do with this, uh, with this excellent data. So uh, I know this shot's a little bit small. This is an app called Volto. It used to be called Incredimail. Uh, it's, it's like a email client plus or something where it's, it's on tablets and, and mobile devices and it's, uh, it's a very cool user experience that they make email beautiful is, is, what, they, uh, is what they say. Um, and uh, they also have uh, some other metadata that they kind of 
put along with emails to, to make it a, a bit more useful. But it's certainly built on email as the, as the base layer. Uh, this company is called Contactually, and they're kind of like an automated personal assistant uh, where they look at your contacts, and, and you can define some contacts that you want to remain close to. And, and the app will kind of prompt you and say, you know, hey, you, you, know, you might want to reconnect with, with, uh, with one of your friends. Uh, this app is called Streak, and it totally lives inside of Gmail, and it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, I, we actually use this one at Context.io uh, pretty often. Uh, those those multicolored boxes is what uh, they call a, a pipeline, and what you can do is you can move an email into one of those boxes, and the user assigns the meaning to what each box means. So you could be tracking bugs. You could be, uh, it could be a sales funnel. It uh, could be customer support. Um, I actually use uh, Streak to, to share feedback about the API with, with my engineering team, uh, where I have like, you know, like this week, last week, then, then Hall of Fame. And so I, I can share emails with the whole team that way, but it's, um, it's pretty interesting uh, software. Uh, this company is called OpenERA. Uh, they help uh, users manage file attachments and make it easy to move it in, into the cloud. Uh, so, I mean, you know, attachments, when they get buried in the inbox, is, uh, is really annoying. I, I know that I, I probably spend many hours searching for old attachments that I end up can't finding and have to have people resend me. Uh, you, you might want to build just a simple uh, uh, email uh, productivity app. Uh, so, what this app is called Mes uh, Message Finder by a company called Other Inbox. And it's basically like auto filtering and, and classifying emails. So, you know, market emails come in and and you know you start to see a, a, a shift where actual uh, email providers like like Gmail is is doing this now, where they they're, they're adding in features on top of email. Uh, Outlook.com does the same kind of thing. They have some kind of uh, message classification as well. So uh, you know that is certainly a, a need, and and you, and you you could use email data to, to power those kinds of productivity apps. Uh, and this last company I'm going to talk about is called Unified Inbox. Uh, they have not launched yet. Uh, but they're solving a pain point that uh, a number of startups are actually trying to, to, to solve right now, where it's the problem that we all use uh, email and text messaging and social media to, to talk to each other, but it's different clients for each one, and you have to switch back and forth and, and everything. So uh, as you can imagine, they're trying to unify uh, the inbox, but they, they, uh, they do have to you know, talk to email servers and, and get that email data off and, and kind of aggregate it with other uh, social gestures for their users. So uh, now that I showed you a couple of examples, let's dive into the IMAP protocol a little bit and see exactly what it looks like to connect to an IMAP server and to, and to work with it. So if, if I was actually going to introduce an IMAP server to like a web or mobile app developer, uh, I would maybe say, uh, you know, app developer meet IMAP, IMAP meet app developer. And IMAP would say, I don't give a shit about you app developer because I was designed to just solve the one problem of an email client, just a simple, basic email client that, you know, there's nothing really wrong with, with uh, the IMAP protocol, because when it, it was uh, conceived, it was, you know, many, many years ago before, uh, before the web, before, you know, web applications, and certainly before mobile applications. So it, um, anyway, uh, here's how you start out. Uh, you, you, you can connect via SSL, uh, you can kind of see how that works right there. Uh, and usually you log in with your name and password. Uh, certain email providers uh, like Gmail and Outlook.com uh, offer an OAuth authentication, which is you know, preferable than passing a password around and everything. Um, once you uh, authenticate, then it's the same each time. So your app w will be able to you know, continuously connect and disconnect from the email server as you do all the actions that, that you would need to. So listing mailboxes is pretty simple as well. Uh, one thing I wanted to note though, the term mailbox in the IMAP world, that's what most email clients call a folder. That's what Gmail calls labels. So uh, when I talk about a, a mailbox, it's, re it's really a folder or, or a label. Um, so you, you can see you know, things like you know, inbox, archive, sent, drafts, that, that, that kind of thing. Uh, next, you would select a mailbox to, to work with. So that, you know, that, that command does look pretty straightforward as well. Uh, one thing I want to point out, you see the uh, 84 exists right there. Uh, that's the number of total messages inside of that mailbox or folder. Uh, the IMAP protocol allows you to idle 
where you open up a socket and you essentially just watch that number. If it increases, you know that the mailbox has a new message in it. If it decreases, then the user has deleted a message. So at that point, you could take additional actions depending on what your app wants to do. Um, one thing that I wanted to note is that when you idle, there's no information about the flags, which is like seen or unseen, if it's red or, or not red, and, and that kind of stuff. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. So uh, here's how you fetch a message. Uh, the 80 colon 81, uh, that's fetching it via a me message sequence. And I'll, I'll talk a, a bit more about that later on as well. Um, that's how you can flag a message as being read. So you know, all these commands are, are, are seem pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Um, one, one note I wanted to say about flags, uh, that the different IMAP flags that, that, that exist are seen, answered, flagged, deleted, draft. And there's one that's uh, is called recent, but uh, that one's not that useful anymore uh, because uh, a message is flagged as recent if it's the, in the same session that an email client connects to it. If it's a new message, then it's, it's tagged as recent. But you know, what happens if I have an email client on my phone, you know, maybe in a browser, maybe I'm using Outlook and it's a, I have a desktop client. You know, our email accounts have lots and lots of, of things that are connected to it. So you know, that's a flag that's also it's, it's kind of like a legacy from when, you know, when the IMAP protocol was just you have your one email client that connects to the IMAP server and, and that's it. So that's kind of a, 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 kind of a crufty leftover that's, uh, that's not really useful uh, the way that we use email today. And that's how you close the mailbox and log out. So that didn't really seem that bad, right? Well, there's a number of pitfalls that I'm going to highlight uh, right now to kind of illustrate that this is kind of a tricky thing to, uh, to work with. So identifying messages is a major pain point for app developers. Uh, one way to do it is by sequence number. Uh, the sequence number is ascending and continuous uh, in the mailbox, uh, but it is only in one of those mailboxes. So that, that's ju just in a folder. It, it, there, there's no way to fetch all of the, uh, all the mail. Uh, and one thing to note, the sequence number can and it will change in the middle of a session. Because if your app is trying to fetch, you know, oh, the, the first message, well, you're kind of in a race with the user. And he's on their phone and they might archive it or move it around and everything. So that definitely changes uh, in the course of a, of a session. Uh, you could use the unique identifier or UID. Uh, so when a message arrives into a mailbox, it is assigned a, a UID. But if the user moves it to a different mailbox, they archive it, they move it to a different folder or something, uh, then it gets a completely new UID. So you have the kind of non-trivial task of trying to track and see exactly what, what the user is doing if you want to reliably fetch and, uh, the same message over and over again. So uh, pitfall number two, special use folders. Uh, only the inbox has special meaning as far as IMAP is concerned. Uh, the other folders, the client assigns meaning to, not the server. And also, there is uh, locale uh, uh, trickiness around that. Uh, different languages, for instance, uh, it might not be called the sent folder. Uh, in, in, in every language, it certainly won't be. Um, also, one thing to note is that uh, the IMAP server might have uh, multiple sent folders, because uh, if they use different email clients, they might be outgoing or sent. And it's, it might be tricky to figure out which one is, is the real sent folder. Uh, one thing that's interesting, uh, Gmail uh, has done a number of things to extend the IMAP protocol to make this a bit easier to, to work with. So uh, they've actually added mailbox attributes like, like uh, slash inbox, slash sent, slash starred, uh, and that's a reliable way to get around the uh, uh, locale problem. You can just use their attributes rather than try to use the text of the mailbox name. There's no data until you select a mailbox. So uh, Anything that you want to search for a message or fetch a message, you have to pick that mailbox first. Uh, so in the IMAP world, you can't access a, uh, an account-wide list of messages. And threads are the, uh, the, the, the same thing. Uh, it's not widely available, and it's also restricted only to a single mailbox. Uh, this is one area where uh, Gmail does come to the rescue again. With a, they assign a thread ID. Uh, and that's actually in, in the headers. So if, if you're looking at a user's uh, uh, emails and they're uh, a Gmail uh, account, uh, you're, you're able to use that thread ID and you can build the threads exactly how uh, Gmail 
uh, threads them. Attachments. Uh, as far as IMAP is concerned, an attachment is just another mind-body part. So you'll have to fetch the body and parse that, that structure out. Uh, a lot of text parsing. But fortunately, th there are some really good libraries for, for, for working with that kind of stuff as well. Uh, deleting messages is also tricky. Uh, the way that it works is that when a user deletes a message, it actually just flags that message to be deleted. Uh, and then what has to happen is you run an, an expunge command on the IMAP server, and that goes through and actually removes all of the email messages that have been flagged for deletion. And this could happen immediately. Uh, some clients, when you delete a message, they'll flag it and then run expunge immediately. Some, they don't do it for a while. Some IMAP servers have it more on something like a cron job or a, a scheduled expunge. It could be daily, weekly, monthly. Um, so if you fetch messages, you, you want to be aware that you want to check the flags, see if it's deleted, see if that user would expect to see it in the list of messages that your app's showing or not. Uh, keeping up with d what's deleted is also tricky. Uh, so the server doesn't actually tell you which ones were deleted. You have to just look at all the messages you know, now and then look at them a little bit later and kind of do a diff and see, see what the user did. And keep in mind that since everything is in the context of a mailbox or a folder, uh, if you don't see a message and you, you were seeing it before, you don't really know if it was deleted or if it was moved to a different folder. So that, that's, that, that's a, a challenge. Uh, the same thing applies for the scene flag. That's one thing that a lot of apps might want to do is see if an email message is read or, or uh, unread. Um, and so, that, that, uh, again, there's no like list of in the last 10 minutes, this is what has been, the flags have been changed. You have to just kind of do a diff and, and sort things out that way. So that was just basically some, some pitfalls of working with IMAP. Uh, I just want to say that uh, IMAP is just one of the email protocols out there. Um, you know, there's Exchange, that's a totally different uh, language. Um, and I have, I have Gmail and Hotmail up there. Uh, they do support IMAP. Uh, Hotmail, which is now Outlook.com, just recently started supporting IMAP. Um, and, and Gmail uh, has those uh, uh, slightly different uh, extensions, which, uh, which are mostly positive, but you would want to handle Gmail slightly different. And, and also, in the kind of IMAP world, uh, system administrators can configure things differently uh, just depending on the weather, it seems like. So that's uh, kind of like the Wild West out there. So you will have to write a lot of uh, code uh, to, to you know, get this user's uh, you know, inbox connected or, or this one. It's, it's not all uh, as standardized as what we would like as, as app developers. So after you connect to the server and fetch a message body, um, like what does that body actually look like? Uh, so this is what a simple message looks like. That's uh, all of the different uh, headers right there. Then at the very bottom, you can see the content type, text plain. Um, and you can see the message IDs right there uh, as well. That's, that's something that you want to take note of if you want to fetch that message again in the future. So here's what a message body with an attachment looks like. You can see you have a, uh, the MIME type, which is the uh, text plain up there. And then you have the, uh, the image slash JPEG uh, there for the attachment. One thing to note, the content disposition, uh, its attachment, that can also be inline, like if you have a, an image in your signature or that kind of thing, that's, that's how that would show up in there. And then here's a message with multiple uh, parts. So um, this is where, uh, and I'm sure you've, you've seen this before, where you know, the option to prefer messages in HTML or plain text, and so that's just what that, what that looks like. Um, one thing that I want to just point out is that uh, email bodies can get really super ugly. Uh, for instance, Outlook uses the same HTML source as uh, Microsoft Word components. So has anybody looked at HTML that Word generates? Is any, yeah, a couple people. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not the cleanest HTML. It's, <laughs> <laughs> I'll just put it that way. Um, OK, so a couple of pitfalls with, with uh, the, the bodies. The message ID, uh, which is super useful to refer back to that message, it's actually optional in the spec. You don't really need to have it according to, to IMAP. Um, there's one specific case when, it, when it's not there, uh, and that is when an Outlook user sends an email through an Exchange server to another Outlook user that's also on that same Exchange server, which, which you can imagine happens all the time in enterprise and business. 
uh, that doesn't actually use SMTP uh, to send that message. So a message ID is not actually assigned in that case. Uh, in reply to references, uh, so what that usually does is it refers to the message ID of other emails. So that's great for building up threads and conversations. But again, Outlook jumps in and they actually scrub out the in reply to field and they replace it with their own thread topic and thread index. So you know, if you have a variety of users that are some are on Outlook, some are not, uh, building threads can be uh, a, a pretty big challenge. Also, uh, attachments are what you decide. The, uh, it, it's it, with that content disposition. Uh, is it an attachment? Is an inline image an attachment, or is it just someone's signature or logo? Does your app want to treat that as an image or or not? Uh, so that's just a, a choice that that you have to make. Uh, so fortunately, there is a a much better way uh, than going straight to the the servers. And that's uh, context.io. <laughs> um, so what, uh, what, what we are, we're like an abstraction layer uh, between uh, those, the email servers and all that complexity and app developers. And the way that it works is that we, uh, we expose uh, five main resources, uh, threads, messages, files, contacts, and then webhooks. Um, so you know, as an app developer, you can write your code one time. Uh, you can write a nice, you know, REST API code that, that everyone's very familiar with, with writing uh, and, um, and, and work with this data. Uh, and webhooks are really useful too. Uh, a lot of our customers only, only use webhooks um, because that's when we, uh, no, we notify you of some event uh, that happens inside the inbox. So, uh, so that's, that's it for me. That's all I've got today. Uh, thank you so much uh, for listening to me. Uh, feel free to follow me on uh, on Twitter. You can join my parents in being ashamed at how often I t tweet about beer and drinking and stuff. So, uh, so anyway, is it uh, time for questions? It's time for questions. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Much like. Thank you. 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 I could throw the mic. Throw it at him. Uh, so if email is such a great data source and uh, there's so many weird things with the older protocols and there are even newer RFCs like you mentioned, sure. what is preventing this huge industry from like actually making clients and the protocols behave better and innovating on them instead of accepting the old? Yeah, so there's a number of people that are trying to do that, but it's really about kind of traction and momentum. I mean, email is so ingrained and entrenched in our culture uh, and how we use it. I mean, uh, you know, I've uh, actually at, uh, at a company, Return Path is a company that acquired Context.io. They use Outlook and Exchange, and, and we use uh, Google Apps and Gmail, and they're actually migrating to, to Gmail and uh, and even just uh, even though I, I I mean I think there's a lot of, of gain to kind of web-based email you know, clients and that kind of stuff. Uh, there's just a lot of uh, uh, stickiness. You know, people have been been working in these email clients and, and working with email in the same way for you know 10, 15, 20 years. You know, so it's it's very hard to uh, essentially teach an old dog new tricks. I think. Another question upside. Mm. Oh, someone's scratching again. Uh, I, <laughs> I have a, I have a question about you know uh, um, you know maybe a lot of people say data is the new oil of the 21st century and blah blah blah, uh, but it's true and in my opinion. So um, so what is the to your mind what you've seen by using Context IO uh, API by other developers and your ecosystem? What what is the, the the valuable application that you have seen based on email? And, and what is the trend now to, to maybe if we have some entrepreneurs to, 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 um, to tell them where is the value in email from the trends uh, you see? Sure, yeah, I mean, and that's actually a great question because that's one of the things that's, that's one of the bigger challenges as an evangelist trying to get people to work with, with email data is that no one's really used to thinking of, of this as, as a source, as something that would be accessible and, and usable. 
So, um, you know, so r right now we have a lot of kind of uh, CRM type applications and, and uh, e email productivity apps. And in fact, all those apps that I showed uh, are all built on Context.io. Um, but I, I really think that I, we've yet to see the, the, the next kind of great application that's built on, on top of email. Uh, I mean, if you think about all the, all the wealth of information that's, that's in there, I mean, I, I could imagine, you know, maybe like, a, like a, a coupon recommendation company or something that would look at, you know, receipts, marketing emails and stuff inside the inbox and, and really get a good idea of what, of what their users like. Uh, so, I mean, I, I really feel like that, that it's, uh, the, the, the market's wide open um, and there's a lot of demand uh, to solve this, this pain point. I mean, in, in fact, uh, I, I had a, a couple of different uh, evangelist offers before I, I took the one at Context.io. And the reason why I took it is because I really hate email a lot. And if I can go out and talk to an app developer, and if they can build an app that'll save me even just 10 minutes a day out of my, you know, wh whatever I'm doing in, in email, uh, I mean, that, that'll add up, you know? I mean, uh, solve this, make this a much better experience for everybody, and I think we'd all win. Time for one last question. So uh, m my question is to say, uh, I'm a technical guy, but I'm, I'm, I'm talking in, on behalf of CMOs out there. Uh, so CMOs would come and say, uh, okay, so email marketing, e email automation is a low-hanging low fruit out there where we can target people and people will click through. When you start building applications, uh, it's the results that they're receiving is not that great. Uh, for example, Google, when they, um, they have new tabs for social, mm -hmm. for example, for myself, I've never opened that social tab. So all my marketing emails goes into social, which I never click, which yeah. I would have clicked if I have seen that. How would you address those type of people when they have concerns? Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's also a, a really great question. Um, I mean, I, I think that the, the solution really is that, uh, is that it's going to vary for each person. You know, for each end user, has they have different pain points around email, and different app developers are going to solve those different pain points in in different ways. You know, so Gmail is trying to solve it with tabs, and that's you know some people like it, some people hate it. You know, but the thing is that there's going to be ten more startups that are trying to solve that same problem. They're going to solve it ten different ways, and some ways are just going to be more useful than than others, and I, that's the way it should be. I, I think. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tony. Thank so, you very much. Thank you.